Welcome everyone, this is lecture 14. These lecture accompany my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi from Northwest Indiana. I am a nephrologist. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video, spread the word. This is the book and you can find it on Amazon. It's available as an ebook, also paperback. More information will be provided in the description. We are still on chapter one, Disorders of Water Balance, Hyponatremia and Hypernatremia, and this is the last lecture for this chapter. Next time we'll talk about potassium. So uh, we'll still present here case studies in dysnatremia, and this is part four. We'll jump right in. Case 15, ineffective fluid restriction, I should say again. 70-year-old woman with SIADH, she's euvolemic by definition. Serum sodium 124, potassium 3.8, serum osmolality 262, so it's hypoosmolar, hyponatremia. Urine shows sodium 95, potassium 53, urine osm 630, urine volume 1.8 liters. Serum sodium is not improving even though she's adherent to fluid restriction, 1800 cc's per day. Why is fluid restriction is ineffective in this patient? Here's the answer. We can quickly look and we find out the following. Urine osmolality is over 500. We said if urine osm is over 500, then fluid restriction is not going to work. Urine is too concentrated. The patient is dumping the sodium in the urine and absorbing the water. Another way to look at it, you look at urine sodium and urine potassium. You add them up. If they are more than serum sodium, as is the case here, then fluid restriction is not going to work. Now, if you want to be more sophisticated, you calculate electrolyte free water clearance. And we've done that many times before. Again, I'm going to provide the link for lecture four, lecture five, where we explain that. But we have urine volume. We add up urine sodium, urine potassium, and we divide by plasma sodium, and then we get minus 0.342, meaning what is the minus? Uh, minus meaning that the patient is absorbing 342 milliliters of free water. So fluid restriction is not going to work even if you decrease the volume of urine. It doesn't matter as long as urine sodium and urine potassium is higher than the denominator, which is plasma sodium, no matter what you do with fluid restriction, you're still going to absorb some water. So follow these two rules. If you're an osm above 500, or if the sum of urine potassium and sodium is more than serum sodium, then fluid restriction isn't going to work. You have to do something else, maybe salt tablets, maybe urea packets, maybe a loop diuretic. Case number 16, we talked about this concept of polyuria. Let's uh, discuss it again. 71-year-old man presents with polyuria. Urine volume is very high, 4.5 liters. Serum osm is 285. Urine sodium, uh, I'm sorry, serum sodium is normal, 140. Urine osm is 250. And um, uh, urine sodium here is high, it's 82. Urine potassium is 32. Is this polyuria due to water diuresis or solute diuresis? So let's stop here for a second. Do we have polyuria? Yes. Do we have urine volume above 3 liters? Yes, it's 4.5. Now, what do you think? Look at urine sodium and look at urine potassium. They're high, so you can just tell by looking that this is solute diuresis because you have a lot of salt, a lot of sodium. Now, is urine osm low, 250? Well, yes, if we had 1 liter, but here we have 4.5 liters of urine. So the total osmol, osmoles in the urine is 250 times 4.5. So this is about 1,200 milliosmol per 24 hours. So this, this person is eating a lot of salt. Anyway, let's calculate osmolar clearance. And what we do, we have urine osm, 250 divided by plasma osm, 285, and then uh, times uh, urine volume, 4.5. So we get 3.9 liters. So free water clearance is only 0.6, which is 4 minus 3.9. So 
this patient has solidaresis. Why? Due to high intake of sodium. How much sodium? Well, 82 mil equivalent per liter times 4.5 liter, 369 mil equivalent per 24 hours. Remember, low sodium diet is below 100. So this is a lot of sodium. If you calculate electrolyte free water clearance, you get 0 0.8. So it's the same thing. The, the f electrolyte free water, the amount of uh, the amount of urine that is free of electrolyte is 0 0.8. It's, it's close to uh, free water clearance of 0 0.6. So when do you see this situation? So someone like him maybe bought a big bag of potato chips on sale, say at Costco, and ate the whole thing. So now what's going to happen? Sodium is going to rise. Serum osmolality will start to rise, but he's going to feel thirsty. So quickly, he's going to drink a lot of water. So serum sodium, what was it? 140 it didn't really change. Why? Because he quickly drank all that water, four and a half liters, and dumped all that sodium into the urine. So this is why we have solute diuresis. So he ate the sodium, drank the water, and everything was excreted in the urine, and serum sodium is what? Normal. Case number 17. Here we have a 58-year-old man presenting with hypernatremia. Serum sodium 160, serum osm is high, 340, urine osm is 330, urine sodium is 70, and urine potassium is 35. He weighs 70 kilograms. Let's assume that insensible water loss is 0 0.8 and that urine volume is 2.2. How do we replace his water, okay, to return serum sodium to 140? So again, I did this problem, this case, so we know again how to do water replacement in hypernatremia. We said we have three components, insensible loss plus free water deficit plus electrolyte free water clearance. So we're adding insensible loss to how much water has been lost to the amount of free water in the urine. We're not just going to do free water, free water deficit, okay? That's not enough. So free water deficit, uh, that's easy, 160 divided by 140 minus 1 times total body water, which is 42 liters in a 70 kilogram person, so we get 6 liters. But that's not all. We have to add that to the 0 0.75, which is electrolyte free water clearance, to the 0 0.8, which is insensible water loss, and now we get 7 0.55 liters. How do you replace it? Well, you divide that by 2, okay, and if you give D5W at 160 an hour, you'll be done in about two days. So you're going to check serum sodium every 6-8 hours. The next day you re-evaluate, you recalculate, and then you modify your, your, fluid, uh, your fluid rate accordingly. Okay, but usually we, we don't need to replace more than 50% on day one, sometimes less depending on the total deficit. Case number 18, this is the last case, 53-year-old man in the critical care unit, he's on continuous venovenous hemofiltration for acute kidney injury, his serum sodium is 125, he's getting pre-filter replacement fluids at 2 liters an hour with a sodium content, this is standard 140, how do you mitigate against the rise in serum sodium? Now, here we have a situation where the patient is hyponatremic, serum sodium is 125, and he's getting fluids at sodium 140. So if we let that go quickly, his serum sodium is going to rise to 140 and we'll have overcorrection. We'll have really fast correction. So this is not desirable. So what do we do? In reality, this is a complex case. This is way beyond the scope of this chapter or of uh, this um, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, myself with Dr. Bastani, uh, we proposed, we published a mathematical approach to these problems, to severe hyponatremia or hypernatremia in patients on dialysis and also continuous renal replacement therapies. We uh, published that in seminars in dialysis. The reference uh, you can find on this slide, and I'll provide a link. Basically, what do you what do? You, do? you give D5W post-filter, okay? This way you're diluting... Uh, the uh, the fluids and preventing rapid rise of uh, of serum sodium based on uh, the model I proposed. If you give uh, D5W at a rate of 154 mL an hour, then you can achieve a gradual rise of serum sodium to 130, which is by six mL equivalents 
uh, per, per liter, so only six from the 124, and we need to do frequent uh, assessments. Um, if you need further information, please read my article. It would take me probably three hours to explain the whole concepts, which I'm not going to do. This is only uh, relevant to uh, nephrologists uh, and uh, intensivists who do actually continuous renal replacement therapy. This is the uh, article I uh, referred to in seminars in uh, dialysis, and I'll provide uh, the link to it. Okay, now, a uh, fun question. What is serum sodium in sharks? Now, when you're a nephrologist, this is your idea of fun, okay? So, uh, this is a real question. In free-living sand tiger sharks, off the coast of Eastern Australia. Serum sodium is 258, and this is the reference below. You can check it out. So actually, uh, this is about twice as much as it is in human. So next time a shark swims into your emergency room with this sodium, do not consult a nephrologist. So this is not considered hypernatremia. I'm not sure if sharks get hypernatremia or hyponatremia, but 258 is not hypernatremia. Now, um, this, uh, now you're supposed to laugh, um, and I think I'm just going to uh, stick to nephrology and not stand up. Moving on, key points. Let's conclude this chapter on hyponatremia and hypernatremia. Hyponatremia and hypernatremia are very commonly seen in hospitalized patients. They are disorders of water balance. When you have hyponatremia, it means that you are not excreting excess water rather than having too low sodium, usually. Hypernatremia is not enough water, okay? It's due to water loss or inadequate water intake, usually not too much sodium. We've said that a million times. Use of hypotonic fluids is the most common cause for hyponatremia, so usually it's iatrogenic. We do it to hospitalize patients. Now, both hyponatremia and hypernatremia should be corrected slowly, especially hyponatremia. Hypertonic saline should be used for emergency management of hyponatremia. Don't just do food restriction and sit there. Don't give tolvaptan. You need hypertonic saline. Patients who get hyponatremia on thiazides should not go back to taking thiazides. It's done. When you replace sodium and potassium, you should factor in potassium. Giving potassium is exactly like giving sodium. Aquaretics, such as tol tolvaptan, are very effective for treatment of SIADH for euvolemic hyponatremia hyponatremia, and in many cases of hypervolemic hyponatremia, such as congestive heart failure. Water restriction is ineffective as the sole treatment for severe hyponatremia, especially if urine osmolality is over 500 or if the sum of urine, sodium, and potassium exceeds serum sodium. Thank you very much. This concludes this uh, chapter. It's the longest chapter, and uh, next time we're going to talk about uh, potassium. See you then.